Tonight, we're talking about the limits to our entire universe. And even better, tonight, we're not only talking about the limits to our entire universe, we're talking in particular about the matrix limits to our universe. And what that means for us tonight is that for the first time ever, we're going to be treated to the best answers you've ever seen, I promise, to some of the oldest questions that all of us individually have ever wondered, uh, some of the oldest questions that we have wondered collectively, assuming for thousands and even millions of years, thanks to matrix limits, we're going to be treated to answers to questions like, uh, how does our universe work? Uh, exactly why does our universe even exist? And in the same how and why vein, uh, how exactly does life, uh, consciousness, and humanity, as an example, work? And why exactly does life exist? And so, uh, I, I just want to point out that uh, as far as what life's purpose is, what's our purpose, our point here tonight, the point is that the answers we had to these questions before we got here this evening, you know what I'm talking about, the Big Bang model, the Big Bang theory of our universe, there's a problem. And I can illustrate that problem as simply as this, as this cartoon. The fact is, um, almost all scientists that study our universe today, including me, agree that yes, the universe was born out of a, an ultra-dense, ultra-hot state and exploded into existence. Almost all scientists agree that that explosion occurred about 14 billion years ago. Where the problem occurs is when they trace the origin of that explosion back to the beginning and posit that it all, everything in existence, literally grew into existence out of absolutely nothing. And it, it's literally as though the standard model is throwing up its hands and saying, then and there. We can't say anymore, and we can't say what came before. So basically, we can use the caption this cartoon uh, as, as what we're talking about tonight, the standard model. It's good work. In fact, it's great work, and I'll show you why. But I still think it might need just a little more detail right here. And that's what the Matrix Limits fills in for us. It provides answers, um, and it provides answers that I guarantee we can trust and believe in. And I say that because they're answers uh, that come to us from one of the most trusted names in all of science. In fact, probably the most trusted name in the science of our universe, cosmology, Georges Lemaitre. Now, you can see that uh, Lemaitre was a contemporary of Albert Einstein. In fact, Peter and Einstein were actually uh, close colleagues. I'd say good friends. They, in fact, toured California together in the 1940s, uh, giving talks like this about our universe. In fact, after one of those talks, Einstein was quoted as having said after one of the major talks that it was the best description of reality that Einstein had ever heard or seen. And so I, uh, I would just uh, uh, like to point out to introduce Lemaitre more quickly uh, to those of you who, to whom his name is not familiar, that those who do study our universe consider uh, Lemaitre one of the founding fathers uh, of the Big Bang Theory that we do have. In fact, the technical term uh, for the model that we, 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 we work with, the Big Bang Theory, is technically known in part after Lemaitre as the Freeman Lemaitre Rothschild-Walker standard cosmological model of the universe. Now, thanks to Lemaitre's limits, these are answers that not only we can trust and believe in, but they're answers you're going to like and understand because they're easy, they're as simple as literally one, two, three. You can see in the model of the universe, it's just three spheres as opposed to the one sphere model that we have today. And they're answers that we can trust and that you like um, uh, because they're easy, but that we can also use to go places. And by go places, I mean exactly the three-sphere model of the universe based on the matrix limits that you see on the left is exactly the same as the three-sphere model you see in the center as applied to our entire uh, humanity uh, and, and civilization here on Earth. And I'll explain a bit in a minute. But these uh, 
Um, it, the fact that these two overlap is a perfect uh, opportunity to point out that exactly how and why our universe works and exists the way it does is exactly the same as how and why we exist and work the way we do. Uh, one affects the other, and as you'll see tonight, the other also affects the one. So, the only thing that we really need to completely absorb and understand these answers based on the matrix is two things, uh, keywords. Keyword number one, balance, that just makes sense. And keyword number two, consciousness. Uh, a little deeper, but we'll get into it. And um, we can begin by starting not with our entire universe, but first we're going to zoom in to the level of our own super cluster of galaxies, our Virgo cluster, that's a picture of a different cluster, but you can see a Milky Way like galaxy right there, and uh, zoom on into our own home galaxy, the Milky Way, you can see the position of our sun, here comes the sun now, and in fact, we zoom in to our own planet Earth. Because again, the matrix limits, the theory of our universe, impacts all of us here on Earth in ways that boil right down to here and now. But in fact, with this knowledge, we can zoom in, drill down even deeper, we're going to come right on in to our own individual positions as human beings here on the surface of our Earth, and in fact, right on in to our own home city of Toronto, and even into exactly where we're gathered together tonight in the Imperial Oil Auditorium of the beautiful Ontario Science Centre, one of my favourite places on planet Earth. Um, since it first opened back in 1967. And if we're successful, we're actually again going to be able to reach out and reach in to the very hearts and minds and souls and consciousnesses of all gathered together here tonight. And I say that because tonight we're talking about the big picture rules. You know, you've all heard of big girl rules, big boy rules. These are the big picture rules. And I say that because uh, you're simply, in the science of our universe, in the science of humanity, always talking about no matter what your field or view, there's always a bigger picture beyond, and there's always a smaller picture within. And you can see exactly how that applies in the global economic model that you're seeing in the middle here. It is simply a three-sphere model. Sphere one, sphere two, sphere three. Exactly the same as the Lamentius limits model. Three spheres. And uh, really, um, let me just go back. I just want to fill in a bit. This three sphere model of the economy, it basically, like our standard model today, it used to be a, a one sphere model of the economy. The health and wealth of nations was judged basically on their, on their GDP, on their economic output. Well, somebody came along and said, well, wait a sec, the economy is just a smaller part of a bigger picture called society. As in turn, society is a smaller part of a bigger picture called planet Earth. That is the outer boundary to our possible existence as societies and humans uh, here on Earth. Because that's the finite outer limit. And this is exactly the same following big picture rules uh, as what we'll be seeing about our universe. All the major limits to bring to the table is that there's an outer boundary to the possible expansion of our universe. And uh, it leads us to uh, following big picture rules ask, all right, if we want to understand and define our own universe one, we first need to see it in the context of what the big picture is beyond it. And in fact, what's beyond our universe? And the first answer we're going to provide tonight, you're looking. Uh, what's beyond our universe? Just more universes upon universes. It's the ancient Greek idea of um, beyond our universe, just um, into the more universe, right, left, front, back, up, down, all around. And even more interesting, uh, as you probably know, the ancient Greeks believed that within our universe, within each atom, there is an entire baby universe of its own. Technically, within each electron in our universe, there's an entire baby universe. And within that baby universe, there's even smaller electrons with their own universes, and so on, to ever smaller and smaller scales. And similarly, our own universe one, shown here, is itself within just a single electron in an even larger universe, which itself is just a single electron with even 
larger universes, and so on and so on to ever larger and larger sizes. And I just want to, before we go too much further, instill uh, in everyone the fact that uh, this picture handed down to us from the Greeks thousands of years ago turns out today to be the only physical picture of reality possible, period, if two facts are true. Fact one, that space and time are infinite, as they must logically be. And fact two, that our universe is not. And so, by definition, if our universe is not infinite, if it has an end, there must, by definition, continue infinite space, be more universes beyond the depth. Uh, now, that leads perfectly to exactly what the problems with the standard model, the Big Bang model that we have, are that we're here to solve with Lorentz's limits tonight. So, problem one, the fact that our standard model has nothing beyond it. Literally, it posits that all space and time was created in that initial instant, that beyond 14 billion light year visible radius or the 40 billion light year co moving radius, there's literally absolutely nothing. And it just doesn't make sense, as you saw. Uh, but the really big problem is the fact that the standard model as it stands now has nothing before it. There's literally everything springs out of, out of nothing. And so, um, it, it is just, it's a violation of the most central tenets of, of science for thousands of years. I mean, the idea of getting something for nothing violates um, the conservation of matter uh, since the time of the Greeks, violates the conservation of energy uh, since Sir Isaac Newton's time. It violates the conservation of mass uh, energy since uh, Albert Einstein's time. And it continues to violate all these tenets to this day. And so, it literally is so, as though the standard model is saying that a miracle occurs. So, um, why do people like the standard model? Why am I a supporter? Or why do 99.9% .9 of all the scientists studying the universe believe in this model, despite these problems? And the answer is that it, it works. It's brilliant. The standard model we have today, other than what makes limits, is the best description of our universe we've ever had. It explains the recession of the galaxies, the fact that Hubble, as you know, looked out and saw galaxies further and further receding from us at a faster and faster velocity. It explains the background radiation. You've heard of this, the relic radiation left over from the original fireball. Sure, it's cooled down to uh, over 14 billion years, uh, just 2.7 degrees above zero uh, Kelvin. But uh, you can still detect it in the microwaves. In fact, the discovery of that background radiation by Gonzales and Wilson won them the Nobel Prize, as you've probably heard. And the standard model we have now explains the distribution of elements perfectly. I mean, it explains exactly, in the Big Bang, you know, you've got mostly hydrogen and um, some helium, a little bit of lithium. But after that, how exactly do we get as much carbon uh, uh, as our bodies are made of? How exactly do we get as much oxygen uh, that we're breathing into our bodies right now? How do we get exactly as much iron? as is in fact coursing through our veins and carrying all of that oxygen to all of our carbon now. And so the standard model works. It's brilliant. And we don't want to um, change it. We're not here with Lemaitre's limits to throw the baby out with the bathwater. On the contrary, all that Lemaitre's limits is bringing to the table uh, it, it is, is an improvement. It's an improvement. It's going to improve the standard model and then only in as much as dealing with what came for the Big Bang and what lies beyond. And that's all we're talking about with Lemaitre's limits. The standard model stands. It's just in need of some improvement. And to show you exactly what we're talking about, how easy this is, you're looking at the standard model on the right compared to Lemaitre's limits on the left. And of course, as I said, it's just a one sphere model. It's at 14 billion light year expansion radius as we speak. And you should know that uh, the Lemaitre's limits model on the left, technically known as the dynamic equilibrium theory, uh, equilibrium for balance, is basically exactly the same as the standard model we have now, excepting only for these other two spheres. You're looked and see the expansion radius and expansion theory, the Hubble radius, you've heard of this, same Hubble radius in the matrix limits. The only difference is this outer sphere and this inner sphere. And all they mean is that the expansion radius that we have now can only go so far and no further. 
that then it has to contract back in, and it can only contract back in so near, and, 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 and that's it, toward the center of the universe. And um, to really define what these inner and outer boundaries to the expansion of ESR more clearly, all the dimensions of it is saying the universe exists inside the black hole. Now this is not hard for black holes, once you fall in, there's no escape. And it's simply saying that uh, none of matter inside of our universe can ever escape beyond this outer boundary defined as the black holes uh, radius of our universe. And uh, then you have the expansion radius in the middle sphere, you can see that. And what's inside is even more interesting. Uh, I see you reading ahead and you can see that's dark energy and vacuum energy. We've all heard of these in the uh, popular press. But you should know that in that inner sphere, there is absolutely no matter, uh, no mass at all, nor can it be, because it's all repelled out by this vacuum energy. And all the matter has to exist only on that, that surface or beyond. And you've also heard that even empty space, the void of matter, is in fact never completely empty. There's always at least vacuum energy there. And that's what you're seeing. There's no mass, that's a hollow, rotating vacuum energy core, filled with vacuum energy, and, 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 and no mass at all. And really, I can to explain a little bit better what dark energy and vacuum energy are. You might as well learn about them the same way humanity did. Now, this all started with Albert Einstein in 1917. He had the theory of general relativity for a couple of years, and for those two years, he had a lot of problems, because as you know, it's a gravitational theory, and he found that no matter what he did, uh, all his models always wound up collapsing and crushing inwards together with a single point. There's no chance for differentiation in galaxies, let alone planets and life. So he struggles for two years, and at the end of which he throws his hands up, and he, uh, he, he puts it in crush. He makes that hockey for this story before. He puts in a fudge factor. He says, okay, uh, all of this matter and gravitational attraction has got to be counterbalanced by what he called vacuum energy. This is what the dark energy is. It's an outward repulsive force that he attributed to electromagnetic propulsion that actually holds out all of the matter. It repels the matter outward to prevent it from crushing inward. And it produces a perfectly balanced universe. We're going to go back one and show you that that inner core that you're looking at, Lamentra's Limits Universe, that was what the entire universe was believed to be based on Einstein's uh, static model. It's just a universe in balance, and in balance between gravitational attraction and electric propulsion. That's all that vacuum and dark energy are. And uh, how did we wind up with this Big Bang Theory that we have now? Well, uh, it started with Willem de Sitter, a Dutch theoretician in 1917, was improved by Friedman in 1922, whose name you saw really brought home by the in 1927, and then observationally proven by Hubble in 1929, as you know. Uh, but uh, what's important to realize is that in these days before Hubble's discovery, all scientists believe that there were only two kinds of solutions to the theory of general relativity. And I know it sounds like a big subject, but if you just think about it for a sec, there are only two possibilities. Those are A, uh, the uh, changing uh, possibilities, expanding, dynamic, contracting, case B, and the unchanging possibilities, the uh, static, stationary, stable uh, universes. And all scientists, Einstein included, believe the proper solution had to be just one or the other of his possibilities. It could never be both. Well, to my knowledge, the only scientist then and to this day who said, well, hey, wait a sec, why couldn't it be both? Why couldn't you have case A, the unchanging static stationary model, nestled inside this, this hollow vacuum energy core, repulsive energy holding all the matter outward, an unchanging uh, part of the universe, surrounded by a dynamic, a changing, an expanding and contracting universe, all in one single theory. It's a brilliant hybrid, years ahead of its time. And then even better, he wraps it all up in a nice neat package uh, that's placed within a, a, a black hole. And
and, and this is it. You, you, you've seen, in a nutshell, exactly how the universe works according to Lemaitre's limits. Uh, and the beauty of adding Lemaitre's limits to the standard model that we have now is that it allows, with Lemaitre's limits, the standard model to fit in with infinite space. It solves problem one in the sense of replacing the idea that the universe exploded out of absolutely nothing. It replaces the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it, it solves problem one of the fact the belief that there's nothing beyond our universe that fits in with infinite space because it posits, thanks to the matrix limits, there's a boundary, and therefore if our universe has a, a, a limit of boundary, if space is infinite, there must be other universes beyond that to fill that infinite space in beyond our universe. So it solves problem one of the standard model uh, by replacing the nothing beyond with multiverses beyond. And it solves problem two of the standard model by allowing it with Lemaitre's limits added to fit in with infinite time. It replaces the idea of nothing coming before uh, the Big Bang with the fact that there was something before the Big Bang. And it replaces the idea of the universe having shrunk down to a size of absolutely zero uh, with the fact that it could only have shrunk down to a minimum uh, certain size defined by the vacuum energy pool. Um, one other thing that adding Lemaitre's limits does for the standard model I did mention. There's a, a terrible fate, a terrible future in store for us if the standard model stands as is without the nature's limits. It's certainly called the heat death of the universe. And this just makes sense in, 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 the, in the fact that if our universe does continue expanding unendingly, then by definition, everything in our universe is going to move ever further and further apart. Everything in our universe, in that case, would grow ever colder and colder. Uh, everything would become increasingly isolated, increasingly alone, and increasingly dark. Well, that's not the fate or the future of our universe if we have Lemaitre's limits. Because with Lemaitre's limits, the expansion can only go so far and no further. Everything in our universe can only grow so cold and no colder. It's almost like invoking the Goldilocks rule and saying uh, our, our universe uh, can get not too cold, not too hot, but just right. That's what Lemaitre's limits is. But the main reason for life in the nature's limits, or wishing to add them to the standard model, is because of this key word, balance. It allows for a balanced expansion. So you have expansion out, contraction in, expansion out, contraction in. As opposed to without the nature's limits, what you have today is unbalanced expansion. Because it's all expansion all the time. That's all it ever does and ever will. And because that all proceeds in one direction and one direction only, not balanced. So that's the big advantage of adding uh, the nature of limits. Uh, and you can see this is entirely all we're talking about in this theory of the universe. Basically what we have now with adding only that outer boundary and inner boundary is explained. And uh, that basically explains how our universe works it, it, according to the nature of limit. It, it works because it's in balance as defined by the major limits. But we promise to talk about not only how uh, our universe works, the way it does, but why. Uh, and for that, we need to get into key term number two, uh, consciousness. Now, a little deeper, and first, we need to remember that vacuum energy we're talking about, uh, to my knowledge, nobody's succeeded in defining it any better uh, than in other the, the very coarse uh, terms I just uh, described it uh, uh, in. It's basically a repulsive force that counterbalances gravity. But that's it. Uh, as far as exactly how it came to be or, or why it exists, uh, not so much is known. And uh, the same could be said about consciousness, about life. Exactly how and why did life and consciousness emerge? And so tonight, we're going to go for a two for one. We're actually going to, uh, we have vacuum energy on the one hand, life and consciousness on the other. Uh, we wish to define both in better terms. I'm actually going to say that one equals the other, and the other equals the one. Uh, that the dark energy, the vacuum energy in the inner core of our universe is actually equivalent to a life energy, if you will, a consciousness energy, if you will. And I say that because the vacuum energy can be equated with life 
energy, conscious energy, because of the fact they share at least uh, half a dozen uh, facts in, in common. They share a common principle, uh, a common universality, uh, they share a common arithmetic, a number, which I'll show, uh, a common geometry in terms of the direction uh, they both work, common definition, and common logic. And if you think we're going out on a limb here, I want to assure you, maybe, but not as thin as you might think, because uh, many, uh, perhaps even most, of the scientists who study our universe today uh, believe in and are on board with what's called the anthropic principle. It's just a way of incorporating uh, the presence of life in studies of the universe. Uh, the weak anthropic principle uh, simply posits that our universe is, in fact, fine-tuned to make life. Uh, it, it's as though the universe were made to make life. Uh, where the strong anthropic principle goes a little bit further, not only is the universe made to make life, but the universe actually requires life uh, to exist uh, as a conscious mirror to reflect the existence of the universe's own conscious and non-conscious energy. But another thing that vacuum energy and life share is their universality. In fact, they're everywhere. You're looking at a picture of the vacuum energy core within the center of our universe, about one-third the size of our universe, in something like a galaxy, it's down to one five hundred thousand. Uh, for the sun, it's even smaller. And in the center of our planet Earth is a hollow vacuum energy core, according to the limits, that is one twenty-three millionth the size of our entire planet. It's literally, uh, inside of our Earth is a region, 0 0.6 centimeter diameter, that has absolutely no matter, even though it's in the core of the Earth, that is filled with vacuum energy. And that these hollow vacuum energy cores that you see from the universe throughout all bodies within the universe, everyone, including our own bodies right now, have a hollow vacuum energy core, uh, are what feeds vacuum energy from these cores throughout space and throughout massive bodies. This vacuum energy flows from everything, everywhere, at all times. It's as though it were made of neutrinos, which are also not made of mass like the vacuum energy. It just flows right through planets, right through us, and through everything. And that universality of vacuum energy is very similar to light, because as scientists are beginning to appreciate and understand increasingly, life is everywhere. I mean, no matter where we look, uh, wherever life can be, life is found. And, and so they share that in common. But something even more interesting that uh, vacuum energy and life share in common is this number. Uh, and I, I knew you'd recognize it. This is number pi. It relates to the fact that the vacuum energy core of our universe is exactly pi times smaller than the other boundary. You can see that. And what that means is because energy is proportional to wavelength, is that if you include the vacuum energy, our universe's total energy is exactly pi times larger than just its rest mass energy alone. And why that factor of pi is important, why it's important that the, the universe has exactly pi times more energy uh, than its own rest mass energy, is because uh, human beings, life forms, like us, are also able to exert exactly pi times uh, more energy in, in their own way. And I'll illustrate that. I'll show you the International Weightlifting Federation records. You can see the weightlifting classes on the left, the weightlifting records in the center. And what I want to show is the maximum weight that a human being can lift compared to their own weight. On the bottom, about 2.3, but what I'm pointing out is as we go up toward the top here, you see it approaching a limit. The lighter class of humans can lift maybe 2.8, 2.9. And my point is about the limit that a human being can lift compared to their own weight, their own rest mass, is two things. One, it's over three, and two, it's not much over three. So we're saying that a human being can lift exactly pi times their own weight. And why that's interesting is it means that a life form, like a human, has exactly as much control and energy over their own rest mass as the universe has over her own rest mass. So light and vacuum energy share that in common. And this factor of pi, you know, this it could not be more cosmic or cosmically connected to all scales and levels in the universe. It's simply a recurring pattern you see from the atomic to all uh, scales and sizes beyond. 
you're simply talking about the, the geometric ratio between the circumference of a circle and its diameter. It could not be more important. In fact, I can illustrate that by showing uh, that our good friends at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, uh, right here in Ontario and Waterloo, have in fact uh, made the very logo for their incredibly esteemed and prestigious institute uh, after the word for pi. It's that important. Uh, something else that vacuum energy and life share in common is these directions I was talking about. The fact is, we all know that uh, all matter and energy in our universe uh, is attempting to come together into groups because of gravity. Uh, but we should reflect upon and appreciate the fact that the only two things in our universe that are actually uh, rebelling and repelling against that inward contraction of gravity are one, vacuum energy, and two, life. And they share a similar direction in terms of entropy. You've all heard of this. The universe wants to become increasingly disordered. Um, easier way to put it. Everything wants to go. The second law of thermodynamics, everything in the universe is cooling. So all of the atoms in our universe want to all eventually over time cool down the same uh, temperature, absolute zero. There's absolutely no differences, no peaks, no valleys, or it's called technically a random distribution. And the only two things in our universe that are fighting, rebelling and repelling against that random, that increase in disorder, the only things in our universe that are increasing order are vacuum energy and life. That's it. Uh, so, seen in these terms, it's not hard to equate vacuum energy and life in terms of the fact that they both involve order versus disorder. They both involve information versus non-information. And what we're saying is they both involve conscious versus non-conscious energy. Uh, I can illustrate how the vacuum energy in our universe causes it to be ordered uh, by simply re recalling the fact that Einstein's original theory without the vacuum energy core, it just everything crushes into the center. There, there is no universe as we know it or order. Whereas with the vacuum energy core, look, everything, you've got a big bang, goes out to the maximum, comes back in, big bang out, contraction in, over and over again. Uh, and I can illustrate the concept of order versus disorder, information versus non-information with this incredibly highly produced graphic that I spared no expense for using for tonight. You can see uh, it's got a bottom line, part of the pun, which represents that random zero distribution we're talking about. And you could look at this line as though it were a, um, a, a, heart, a flat line, a heart monitor hooked up to, to no one at all. It's just going along zero, zero, zero over time, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then suddenly, bam, boom, there's a blip, a bit of information. That is a one versus zero uh, of information. Uh, uh, an example of an ordered uh, peak arrangement compared to a completely disordered uh, background. And in fact, we know that this type of bits and bytes uh, information is what we ourselves are made of in our genetic code, what gives rise to the conscious minds that we're using right now to absorb this. And you should appreciate that the only things in our universe that work in this binary zeros and one bits and bytes uh, code program information kind of way are the universe's atomic particles and life. Everything else uh, in our universe is not that uh, digital or binary. So it allows us to posit, again because of this key word, that what we're talking about is simply a balance between conscious and non-conscious energy, between living uh, versus non-living matter, and between order uh, versus disorder. And um, I, just, I don't want to confuse uh, anybody with the idea that if you take all of the life forms on our planet, uh, it's understood that they don't weigh in total at one trillion of what the mass of the Earth is. That's not the balance we're talking about. The balance we're talking about is that that hall of vacuum energy core in the center of our planet, uh, right now in the nature's limits, uh, has exactly the energy equivalent of, of the entire rest mass of our entire planet. That's what's in balance. And just to extend that idea of balance a little bit further, a little bit deeper, what we're positing is that the vacuum energy core of our universe, or the uber consciousness of our universe, actually requires individual consciousnesses like us to exist in order to have us mirror and appreciate the universe's own existence. That's all we're saying. 
so you can say that exactly how our universe works is because it's in balance based on the venture limits. And exactly why our universe works and exists the way it does is because it's conscious. And I can perhaps drive that home a bit more uh, by showing this. I mean, we're all sitting here. We all appreciate time moving on. We all know that at some point our own lives come to an end. And every one of us, in our souls, in our hearts, deep in our guts, believes that when our lives do it, that our conscious minds do not. That all of that conscious energy, all of these experiences, everything we've built up and learned over the years, you can't create or destroy matter. All forms of energy simply transform from one form to another. And so too, we believe in our, in our minds that when our time comes, our conscious energy doesn't disappear, it's not destroyed. It goes on to what we typically refer to as a greater place, a higher place, a deeper place, if you will. And it is not that much of a stretch to posit that the place that it goes is this hollow back of energy core in the center of our Earth. And that's all uh, we're saying, and we can illustrate this concept with something as everyday as uh, going out to a major motion picture. It, it just happens to be incredibly funny that the uh, major motion picture studio that's relevant to tonight's talk on the universe, it's universal. But you see a perfect illustration of the idea of energy emanating from the center of our planet, radiating outward, and infusing, infusing everything on the surface with this cosmic energy we're talking about. You can see this in something uh, like this map of the internet from 2010. Again, energy radiating outward from the central point and filling up a surface. And so, we're simply suggesting that the place when uh, we pass on, that our conscious energy returns to, is this vacuum energy core, that when a, a new life form is born, uh, technically when they're conceived, uh, and they change from inanimate matter to animated matter, what's happened is that the conscious vacuum energy core of our has infused that entity with the same conscious energy running through our minds right now. Um, but it's a little easier to support the idea that our universe itself has consciousness. And I say that because you look in the universe and you see all kinds of examples of these patterns. You're looking now at what are called Fibonacci spirals. And you see them at all levels and size in our universe, from the size of the galaxy uh, to the size of hurricanes on the Earth, to the size of seashells in the ocean, and this is no accident. These Fibonacci spirals are the result of a very exact sequence of numbers that can be boiled down to an even more exact uh, specific equation that result in a very exact number. Fibonacci ratio 1.618034 to 1, and if you take that number in, in sections, so 1.6 versus 1 across, and, and rotate those sections 90 degrees, out comes these beautiful spiral patterns that again occur on all levels throughout our universe, from small to large. And what's interesting about these is you're looking at what is technically called a fractal. You've heard of these fractals. It's simply a pattern like this that repeats itself over and over and over again to ever larger and larger scales and over and over again to ever smaller and smaller scales. And the fact is our universe itself it's just a fractal. We saw earlier, it too is just repeating its pattern over and over and over again into ever larger and larger sizes and to ever smaller and smaller sizes. And you see a thing like this and you can't help but wonder that there must be some underlying order, information, consciousness at work uh, and play in the universe. Uh, an even better example, this as you can see from the bottom is the uh, famous in physics, the fine structure concept, the fine structure ratio. Uh, we're talking about a number of 137 to 1, roughly, you can see it exactly there. But our point in showing this illustration, two things as different as the entire sun uh, compared to a hydrogen atom follow exactly the same fine structure pattern. What you're looking at here is the fact that the outer radius of both of these objects, as measured and observed exactly, are both exactly the size of their inner radius. You can see the black hole of the sun, the Compton radius of the electron of the hydrogen. Uh, 
Uh, and if you just multiply those inner radii in both cases by this factor, 137 once, 137 again, and then factor 4 pi, correct. You're at the same other bound. So you see a pattern like this, and you think, and these repeat everywhere. I mean, throughout atomic physics, this, this couldn't be more important. Uh, again, they're just, it, it, it's so precise, it's so perfect, it's so thought out and organized. They're just, they're, you can't help but think there's got to be an underlying order, information, and consciousness. And I can assure you, it is not uh, as hard as you might think to take all these cosmic ratios and cosmic numbers and work them together into a very jiffy and spiffy way to pretty much specify everything that's going on within our universe and the size right within the atom down to the Planck scale and right on up to uh, the size of the entire universe. But uh, that's a lot to take in uh, and it, it would take a lot of time to kind of get into it. So for now, I've got a, 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 a stickier example of how the universe can be thought of to have consciousness of itself. You're looking at, after the speed of light, probably the three uh, most important constants in physics are the constant of gravitation, uh, the Planck constant that governs all quantum mechanics, all quantum phenomena, the Avogadro number, that's just the uh, number of simple hydrogen atoms in a single gram of matter. But what you should notice here is the fact that all three of these most important physics constants uh, not only share the same first three numbers uh, with each other to within 10%, but they also, they all share the same first three numbers as each other to within 10% as well as with the number 6, 6, 6. Now I'm not making that up. Look and judge for yourself. The bottom one is the worst defender. It's like 10% of it. But those first two, constant 1 and constant 2, are with 1%, 2% respectively of that number. And you see a thing like this, you go, well, my gosh. Uh, the coincidence between the constants itself is pretty funny. But when you see they add up to something probably the most widely recognized number, at least in the Western world, in terms of a sequential uh, three-digit repeating number, uh, that's, that's, that's just funny, huh? And you sort of can't help but think, my gosh, uh, it, it li it's literally as though Mother Nature herself is up there right now, uh, looking down at all of us in this room, and laughing her tail at the fact that she puts in so much evidence, so much proof, so many signs, if you will, that for sure there's an underlying order the information consciousness the way everything works. And yet so many humans still uh, just don't get it with all the evidence. And I have some mathematical support for positing this idea that the universe not only has consciousness but a sense of humor. The fact is that a mathematical definition of humor exists thanks to somebody who don't, should know something about this, Chuck Jones. Producer of Bugs Bunny. Define humor thus. All humor equals accident or error. By which we mean, uh, so, um, why did coyotes roaring down the highway? Boom! And it drops in his head. Or you see how many Sam is uh, walking along? Boom! Falls over a cliff. It is all based on accident or error. And I know it's a lot to absorb. It took me years to really take in this definition and finally accept it as actually valid. Uh, but for all of us here gathered together now, I would just say for now, uh, in the words of former Governor of California, of, uh, California Arnold Schwarzenegger, give me now, leave me later. But this is the answer. And it is what gives us, as I say, the mathematical um, footing, if not actual foundation for positive. And not only does the universe have a a consciousness, as indicated by the incredible coincidence between these physics concepts, but she has a pretty good sense of humor, as indicated by the fact these all sink in with a number from a religious. I mean, that's just fun. So, uh, we could sum by saying that our universe, uh, uh, how it works is, again, as we said, because it's in balance, based on the nature's limit. And exactly why it works and exists the way it does is because it's conscious. And the same is true uh, of, of life and uh, humanity, as an example, and individual consciousnesses. Uh, they exist, uh, and how they work is that they're in balance with the universe. And why they exist as individual consciousnesses is because the universe requires them to exist in order to appreciate the universe's own consciousness. Um, now, 
I just want to, for those who may wish to know any more uh, about the Nature's Limits Action, I uh, recommend you could try uh, my article on the Nature's Limit published in our society's uh, venerable uh, journal of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada uh, earlier this year. And uh, for those of you here who may have uh, actually read uh, that paper already and came on to a little bit more tonight, uh, here's a little bit more because all we published in the paper was basically what's shown in green. So here we've added in yellow the actual numbers that apply. And as you can see in the red over there, the fact that we're illustrating that you would think that Lemaitre's limit would actually be the outer one of these three spheres. But interestingly, it's actually the middle one. And it's the middle one because I know earlier we were defining the middle sphere as the expansion radius, but that doesn't really make sense because, frankly, the expansion radius can be any value out to the outer boundary and down to the inner one. Uh, although, you know, you could say the Lemaitre's limit actually represents the exact average mean value over all time of the expansion radius. That's actually a pretty good way of looking at it. But uh, the technical definition of the matrix limit is really, if you look over on the right, it's actually defined as the gravitational radius of our universe. And you should know that the gravitational radius of all our massive bodies, including our universe, is exactly half. It's always exactly half of the black hole Schwarzschild radius for those bodies. And so the matrix limit being the middle sphere, uh, because of that definition, already has an outer boundary, uh, the black hole radius built into it. But it even makes uh, more sense if you look at the numbers that we filled in. There's the major limit and the fact that the uh, current expansion radius of our universe uh, is around 14 billion light years. Well, that's exactly where the major limit is, is coming in. That's, that's what we observe up there. It's about 14 billion light years, as you've heard. Uh, and it also uh, adds the fact that the maximum that our expansion radius can ever reach in the future is uh, double that, is 28. Uh, billion light years. Uh, so that's a little bit more than we had in the article. And then for anybody who may have gone into uh, the paper and write down the leaves and done some of the math in there and uh, come up with the uh, answer to the matrix limit, the 14.2 uh, giga light year radius, 14.2 billion light year radius, uh, and wanted uh, more, uh, I brought uh, with me tonight a um, a simplification, kind of mathematical magic trick, a way to get all these terms and all these numbers and all this uh, mathematical rigmarole. There's actually a little trick uh, that you can use to get at the nature's limit uh, almost instantaneously and easily, quickly. Uh, first, you should know that in all of general relativity, basic general relativity anyway, uh, all you really need to know is just two constants. The speed of light just makes sense, and the gravitational constant. And here they are. And once you have these, uh, I invite everybody, go home, go to your calculators, plug in these numbers, and out will come this answer. That is the matrix limit based on simply c squared over g. Now you can see there's some dimensional fudging around, but that represents basically the number one, and you don't have to worry about the dimensions. Out comes exactly that answer, and when you get home and do it, hope you all will, uh, you'll see that number of centimeters comes out, and of course you know it's divided by the number of centimeters in light year. And sure enough, the matrix limit 14.2 billion light years in just that uh, easy piece of way. Uh, and in fact, uh, what we wrote in the article is once you have that number, uh, you can, if you look over there on the right, there's that expansion radius. And you can see that once you know the radius, and of course we know the speed of light already, then out comes the Hubble constant. And we wrote in the article that that Hubble constant, you see at the bottom line here, don't worry about whether it's in velocity of kilometers per second or distances to make a parsec. Just the point is that the Hubble constant predicted, based on the matrix limits, has a value that we're even going to round it up. 68.7. Take that. And I say that because we uh, at the NASA IPAC Extragalactic Database keep track of the Hubble constants that have been published, uh, well, since the beginning. In fact, funnily enough, the first one was published in 1927. But uh, since 1980, about 600 estimates of the Hubble constant have been published by astronomers. And uh, so tonight, uh, I brought with me just for you, uh, just the most recent 20. And when I say most recent, if you look at the date column on the right, you can see that these most recent two uh, are both from 2013 and both from the month 10. That's October. We're in October right now. So these are up to the month, if not up to the minute. And I just want to draw your attention to, for a second to, to the top value. Uh, and I, I zoom in on that because that value is, 
is thanks to NASA's uh, Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropic Program, WMAP mission. This is the mission that has been looking at the background radiation for nine years. And this is the mission that gives us this most accurate ever, most precise estimate of the Hubble constant ever published today. And you can see that it's within 1% of the 68.7 value predicted by Lemaitre. So the future, uh, in terms of being able to actually prove Lemaitre's limits uh, based on observation, uh, looks bright. Um, perhaps even assured. Uh, but finally, just for the fun of it, I wanted to show that using these simple uh, ratios, just these two constants, you could all go home and have a ton of fun building your own universes, your own universes in the privacy of your own homes. Tons of fun for all, uh, fun for your all. Uh, it, it, you could just use these, you know, C squared over G, C over G, C4 over G squared, uh, G over C, and out comes the universe's exact size, uh, her exact age, her exact weight, so to speak, her mass, and her exact frequency, her exact resonant frequency. And I brought this here tonight just for, um, well, not just for, but we have a, a, a number of fantastic uh, musicians uh, here, Canadian musicians and musical talent here in the audience with us tonight. And I thought they would be particularly amused uh, by the fact that the resonant frequency of our universe, if you scale that up 66 octaves, um, if you <coughs> double that 66 times, the note that comes out is E. E3, as a matter of fact, I'm not a musician, I hope I'm saying that correctly, but the musical note E. So, um, I just wanted for anybody who also wanted to see, out of all these answers based on the matrix limits, uh, is it or not a nice uh, single equation you put on a coffee cup or a t-shirt, and this is that equation. Uh, it's not the musical note E, it's the fact that E energy equals pi mc squared, I know you're used to seeing E equals mc squared, that famous equation of Einstein's, and that's because that defines the rest mass energy of the particle. But we saw earlier that if you include for our universe all of its vacuum energy, that the total amount of energy in our universe, which is what you're seeing defined here, is in fact pi times its rest mass. So the answer in the equation is E equals pi mc squared. Uh, and I just want to assure you before we let you go home um, tonight that, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll talk a bit before we do about where all this is heading after tonight, but I first want to just touch on how, how we arrived here, how we got these answers where they came from. It, it, it bears pointing out that we are talking uh, throughout about very old and uh, in some cases ancient knowledge uh, that I can illustrate with the all-knowing eye. Uh, you can see, recreated, that we're talking about a spiritual energy, a conscious energy emanating out from the central point and radiating outward into space. Exactly as we were illustrating earlier with the vacuum energy from the vacuum energy core of our Earth. Now, that's very uh, ancient knowledge and uh, it's a fact that uh, Georges Lemaitre uh, is much more contemporary soul, he's not ancient, um, but it's old knowledge. And further, you should know, as you probably can gather from the photograph uh, of, uh, of Lemaitre, that he um, may have been not ancient himself, he's fairly contemporary, but he was ordained three years before he produced these answers as a Catholic priest. And continued to work for all his days, uh, in fact, was the Pope's uh, president of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Uh, and so, Lemaitre worked for a very ancient order. And I just finally want to add that I know a lot of people think, gee, uh, if the answers to how and why our universe works, um, you know, you might have been hoping for something new something out of the blue. Uh, but if you stop and reflect for a second, it just makes sense. It's so often the case that the answers we've been seeking all along have in fact been right in front of us uh, the whole time. That's the case with the nature science. But finally, I just want to be able to show you, uh, before we go on to where this, this leads to after here, 
I want to send you home with a certain knowledge that the answers that you've seen here tonight um, are, are valid. That you can see with your own eyes how these fit together. Because you're looking at a picture of uh, human eye on the right. And I just found this myself a week ago, and I'm still kind of blown away. The fact is, when you overlay the matrix limits onto uh, a human eye, uh, the fit is perfect, assuming only that you dilate that pupil to its maximum extent for night vision in order for that pupil to be able to absorb uh, as much information as possible, like uh, you are all doing right now. Uh, and so it's, it's a perfect match. There's, there cannot be a better sign in existence that this is a valid set of answers to the questions that we've been attacking tonight. So where does all this go from here? Uh, after you go home and plug these uh, C squared over G into your calculators, what does it all mean? Uh, I want to assure you that with or without the matrix limits, the future of humanity is more assured than I think uh, anybody realizes. And I say that because you're looking at a graph of human evolution here, that has to do with this incredibly important number of pi. Looking at a graph of how accurately humans have been able to calculate the number of pi over the last 4,000 years. And you can see going back to the beginning, it's just a couple of digits, and then over thousands and thousands of years, that starts to rise and up to the last few hundred years ago, you're up to a couple hundred digits. But I want to draw your attention to what happened in 1945 when the eventual first electronic computer, the ENIAC. Boom! Shoots right off the scale. Suddenly we've got pi to a trillion digits and growing exponentially. And what you're seeing is an exact picture of human evolution, our evolution, from before computers compared to human evolution after computers. And I'd like everybody to notice, please, we have all collectively grown exponentially more powerful than we ever were before, thanks to computers. I also want to point out, technically what you're looking at is called hockey stick. No, I know that all of us are more familiar with that more famous, I should say, infamous hockey stick graph that wants to do with uh, global climate change, global warming, if you will. You see the temperature rising steadily, and then boom, it shoots off the charts with the Industrial Revolution. That's, that's very negative. It's got a kind of connotation, bend over, kiss your dairy, or buy wrong. Uh, I would liken that to uh, a bad guy's hockey stick graph. And as a uh, loyal, true, proud Canadian, I thought it only fair that I bring you tonight a good guy's hockey stick graph. So I'm going to do battle with that idea and to prove to you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I want everybody here to appreciate that it is with our computers, as it is in our own everyday lives, but it's with our computers it, as a global, collective human civilization that we are going to be able to meet and greet and beat every challenge far enough that we face in our future. I guarantee it. This is the proof. But I also uh, want to say that with the matrix limits, our, our future is even more sure. Because with the matrix limits, I know you want to get into the jazz and science stuff and what it all means in terms of energy and action and adventure. But the most immediate impact of the matrix limits on all of us is, is in fact going to be not scientific but philosophical. And I say that because we're all familiar with uh, today's a day and age of um, no limits, no boundaries, large S, excess, uh, no holds barred. And with the addition of low nature's limits to our global consciousness, uh, a lot of that's going to change. People are going to stop and realize that, in fact, there are boundaries, uh, a finite uh, uh, limit to what we can and cannot achieve here on Earth. And that by understanding and appreciating and absorbing loving these boundaries, it's going to make all of us a lot better able to work well and play well together in our future. But for the exciting factor, really what the matrix limits is going to lead to is at least a thousand times more energy than we have ever had uh, in our past. The ability to, with vacuum energy, uh, and this is not rocket science, you've seen this on Star Trek, it's on TV. Yeah. <laughs> to be able to get out of any gram of matter, every 100% of the rest of NASA energy out of that, that's all we're talking about. And just by doing that, we are going to be 1,000 times, literally, more powerful than we have ever been in our history. And, and of course, with all of that awesome power, uh, comes awesome responsibility. And the way we're going to meet and greet that awesome responsibility 
gets right back to these computers and the quantum leap that they themselves are making. The fact is, you're looking at an illustration of, you've heard of these quantum computers, and so these computers uh, are going to become even more and more powerful in the future and enable us as humans and individuals to do even more and more, uh, both individually and together. And where this is all leading, with the matrix limits and computers and human civilization, is ultimately to a meeting of the minds between our own conscious minds and the consciousness of our entire universe. I'm talking about literally uh, a consciousness machine. This is an illustration of it, but technically I guess level one uh, of a conscious machine would be what you call a Turing machine, an Alan Turing machine. That's a, a computer so powerful that a human being interacting with it through a keyboard and a teletype would not be able to tell if they're interacting with another human being just like them, or in fact, with a, a computer. That's what's in our future. As to why uh, this consciousness is in us and in the universe, what is the purpose, what does it all mean? Uh, the answer is that, and we saw this before in the Anthropic Principle, but it bears repeating before we head on. The uber-consciousness of our universe requires individual consciousnesses like us to exist in order for us to be there to mirror, to appreciate, and be thankful for the universe's own existence. The fact that our universe uh, contains as much order as it does and is as conducive to life as it is, compared to as much disorder as it could, uh, is, 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 is a miracle that we should all be truly grateful and thankful for and appreciate. It's something we should all be happy to celebrate. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.